But how many of you are excited about today? Anyone in this room excited about today? Man, I have been praying, I have been fasting, and I believe that today is going to be a pivotal day. If you're new here today, today's a little bit different than, than normal. Today is our rise and build offering, and many of you have been praying and asking the Lord, Lord, what am I bringing today? And I just pray, man, that we can do this as worship unto God. We're not building a, a house for us, we're building a house for Him. Amen. We're not building a house for for our fame or for us to be seen. We're building a house for Jesus to be seen and to be known in this world, in our cities, and to make a difference around the world. I believe this this day is pivotal in our church's history, and it's an exciting day. And I just want to start off by saying, man, that um, I love this church, and I love this congregation, and just wouldn't really, it's it's an honor and a privilege uh, to lead and to be in this position and Uh, I'm just floored by what the Lord is going to do and so excited about the future and uh, how God is going to use us together to make an impact uh, in this community. I really do believe, man, that the Lord wants to do something so special. And this is really kind of the beginning stages of what's been doing and what the Lord's really kind of been preparing for us. And we've been, uh, as a leadership team, praying so much and interceding and uh, just, uh, I am uh, just excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I don't, know, I don't have a different word other than excited this morning about what God's going to do. And this morning, um, I've really got two, two main goals. Uh, one goal is, is this morning is to restore or to continue to encourage what it is to steward our finances well and to give cheerfully for the kingdom of God. That when we give to the Lord, it should be done cheerfully. I'm going to show you a scripture, and it's actually one that we keep in front of us a lot here at Journey. But we are coming to bring an offering today, and may it be done with cheer and with joy, and not reluctantly, not under compulsion, but just giving to the Lord for his kingdom because we recognize and we see the vision in front of us, and we're saying, yeah, God, we're going to rise and build. The second goal for today is this. And it's just for us to see and to know that, man, nothing is impossible for God. Like, when we think about finances, we think about money, like, nothing is too big for our God. Like, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and sometimes we can look at it through our own earthly mindset. But what I want to accomplish today is to us to begin to think in a kingdom way about money and about finances. So I've entitled my message this morning this. Breaking the poverty mindset. Breaking the poverty mindset. And I want to give you, start off with just a a definition of what the poverty mindset mentality really is. It's this, a poverty mindset is a belief system that the lack I've always seen and experienced in life is a bigger giant than God's promises. I'm going to read it again so it sinks in. A poverty mindset is a belief system that the lack I've always seen and experienced in life is a bigger giant than God's promises. A belief system of lack will stop us from building with God's help the vision in which he's put before us. A thinking that, man, This vision is too big. I don't know if we can accomplish it. Yeah, we can accomplish it. What is it? God can do it though, right? We've got to have a belief system and a knowing in our hearts that, man, God can accomplish it. God can do it. It might be too big for me. It might be too big for uh, the staff as a whole, the leadership as a whole. It might be too big for us even as a congregation. But what I know is it's not too big for God. And that we cannot have this, this mentality of, of lack, this poverty mentality. And so what I want to do right now is I just want to pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak this morning because, man, we need him. We're talking about finances, and when you talk about finances, you need the Holy Spirit to speak. Amen? Yes. Let's go. Let's, Jesus, we are just so thankful for today. God, we come with great joy. God, we come to give cheerfully, Jesus. We come today, God, with an open hand and an open heart, God. And Lord, I pray that today, Father, Lord, you would just lead and guide. 
Lord, I need you to remove myself out of the way. God, I, I, I just want, Lord, your word and your truth to go forth, Jesus. Lord, today, God, it's, a, it's an important day. It's a pivotal day, God. And, Lord, we thank you, God, that, Lord, we get to build with you. That, Lord, you direct the steps of the righteous man. Our steps are ordered by the Lord. And, God, we want to be people, God, that you can look upon. You can say, yeah, I trust them. I trust them. So, God, would you give us clean hands and a pure heart? God, we love you so much. You are so incredible, God. And, Lord, we thank you, God, that your presence is with us today. And everyone said amen, amen, amen. I just want to start off by acknowledging <laughs> the elephant in the room. When you start to talking about finances, everybody gets a little squirmish, you know. Or, you know it's not really something that you want to talk about in the church. And uh, let's just acknowledge right now the elephant in the room. Uh, but why do we feel that way about this? Well, I think that one of the main reasons is that we've seen misuse and abuse in the area of finances. We've seen misuse and abuse in the area of finances and businesses, but also, sadly, within the church. I want to share a story with you, and maybe you can identify with it. Um, about 15 years ago, I was leading worship at a, at a youth conference. I was a worship pastor for, for 18 years, and so I had the opportunity to lead worship at this youth conference, about 1,000 teenagers at this youth conference. And... Uh, we just had this incredible time in the presence of the Lord, and these teenagers encountered God in this life-changing, radical way. And, man, there's nothing like seeing uh, heart change. There's nothing like seeing people encounter uh, the presence of God. And uh, I was just so in awe of what the Lord had done that weekend, but to kind of the culmination uh, of the weekend was... Uh, 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 was, was giving towards a missions organization. And so the guy who's responsible for kind of leading this moment, this time, uh, after all of this had happened at this youth conference and God was moving and working, he stood up in front of the teenagers and he said, God wants you to give every single penny that's in your pocket right now. And then he proceeded to turn around to me and he told me, hey, can you play a money song? And I was thinking to myself, no, I can't play a money song. <laughs> I'm not doing that. That's a little weird. And I felt like in that moment, what was happening was, whether he realized it or not, was there was a little bit of manipulation towards these teenagers who just had this God moment of encountering the Lord. And I kind of really didn't want anything to do a part of it. Actually, I just wanted to leave the stage. And he, I started singing, you know, because 15 years ago, and it was when The Apprentice was really popular. He started singing, money, 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 money. I was like, that does not belong in the church. I was like, why in the world are you singing this song? And I frankly was just incredibly sad in that moment. Even though this kingdom work that was happening in this missions organization was a really incredible thing. But I felt like there was manipulation in the church and things were just not stewarded well in that moment. And my heart, honestly, it just kind of broke for what kind of happened because it kind of ruined almost, I felt like in a way, not ruined, but it, it kind of took away from what I felt like in a way what God had been doing in the lives of these teenagers. And what happens if we're not careful when we've experienced something like this or we've even heard about it or seen it, giving unto the Lord as an offering or through our tithe can ruin that aspect of our worship. And maybe you are in this room or here today and you might be saying, yeah, I, it's hard for me to worship in that way because I don't know if I can really trust it. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, man, you've got to come to a place to where you're able to give cheerfully and us worship unto God and do it not because of what you've seen but because of what God's called you to do. And what I've often seen is that in the area of finances, our finances is one of the last areas that will actually surrender over to the Lord. It's the last area that a believer will give fully over to God. I was praying this week and just really kind of asking the Lord, like, Lord, what do you want me to, to share for uh, this upcoming Sunday? And it was Monday, and the Lord just highlighted to me the prayer of Jabez. 
And now if you have been around the church for any length of time, and uh, if you, especially if you grew up in a Pentecostal church in the, in the 90s, you know all about the prayer of Jabez because there's a book about it. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, and so I want to I read this to you. This is from First Chronicles, and it says this. The Lord just spoke to me in such a fresh way about this. It says, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Now the name Jabez, it literally means pain. His mother named him this because of the pain that she endured from him. And when you think for Jabez for a moment about his name and what he might have carried because of his name being mean. Can you imagine your name being, being meaning pain? Like the embarrassment that comes along with that. I just want to say some of you in this place, this is kind of a side note away from this message, but some of you in this place, I just felt the Holy Spirit just wanted me to highlight to you this morning that some of you have been called a name by your loved ones. Some of you have been called a name by your parents or by someone you, you, you thought was a friend or, or someone else. And, and you might still feel that way, but you've kind of almost accepted what that name that they gave you. I want to encourage you this morning that that is not you. That is not who God's called you to be. You are a son and a daughter of the most high God. And he has called you, he has set you apart, and he's a destiny for your life. Jabez, in this moment, he prayed and he rejected that name that was said about him, that he was pain. And he said, no, Lord, he writes this, he says, Lord, you would bless me indeed. Look at this, verse 10, and Jabez called on God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Now, let's not get too religious <laughs> when it comes to this. Because sometimes we would think, okay, God, I can't ask for blessing. That's, that's, that's something that you don't do. Yes, God does do that. God blesses his people. It's okay to ask for God to bless you. Jabez is asking here, God, would you bless me? There is scripture after scripture after scripture of how God blesses those who are faithful in their giving. There is. Let's not be too religious to reject, to reject that. I, I want God to bless me. I don't know about you. Anybody else want to be blessed by God? And as we are faithful in giving what God has called us to, to, to do and being obedient in that, there is a blessing in it, y'all. There is. There's an absolute bless, blessing. Matter of fact, this is the only area in our walk with the Lord where he says, test me in it. In Malachi, he says, test me in it. Test me and I will pour out a blessing upon you. So Jabez prays, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Then he writes, and enlarge my territory. Listen, God is calling this house to arise and build. I know it. He's giving us a mandate to build and to build for his kingdom, to expand our territory, to arise and to build, to give us a greater sphere of influence in our community and around the world. But how do we do this? Well, this next phrase that Jabez prays that your hand would be with me. Listen, it's only ever God that can expand territory and influence. It can never be us. We can try and try and try and try to make it happen on our own. And I'm talking about for you personally as well. Not just for us as a church, but apply this to your personal life. The only way that you can really see in the enlargement of your territory is only through just really depending on the Lord. Now, you might be able to do it on your own, but man, I'm telling you, you're gonna get to a place where there's, there's burnout and anxiety and everything else, but man, there's something about just resting in the Lord and allowing him to do it. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil. May we protect our heart, mind, eyes from the things of this world then he writes this, he writes and says, that I may not cause pain. We'll come back to that here in a moment. Then he prays, well, actually we see this. And so after this prayer, it says, so God granted him what he requested. <laughs> so God granted him what he requested. I love that God answers our prayer. Come on, do you see that? God answers our prayer. When we pray his will and his kingdom come, God 
answers our prayer. But just to this, this one point here, his last request to the Lord, because he was named pain, and now he prays this, he prays that I may not cause pain. And I felt the Lord just kind of speak to me and drop this in my heart, which is really a lot for the reason why I've kind of said what I've said bef- uh, so far, that many of you in this room have, without realizing it, named God's church pain because of what has happened to you or something that you have seen. Now, first off, I just want to acknowledge that leaders make mistakes. Leaders make mistakes, pastors make mistakes, people make mistakes. We all fall short of the glory. If you look to me, at some point in your life, I am going to disappoint you. When someone says, Adam, I'm with you, I'm, I'm glad you're with me, but Here's the thing, don't follow me, follow Jesus. Don't follow me, follow Jesus, because leaders will disappoint you. Mistakes will be made. Here's the second thing about this, is although you might have felt pain from the past, I've already said before, is this, that don't allow those moments to ruin your worship. Don't allow those moments to forsake the gathering of the believers, to forsake the gathering of the saints. God has called his people to gather together, to give and to serve Don't just be consumers, be contributors where you're giving to the Lord and you're serving with your time and your treasure and your talents and you're doing it all for the glory of God. Let everything, right? Let everything that we do, do it all for the glory of God because what is happening is God is calling you to build his church. Don't allow whatever bitterness or hurt in your life to to hold you back from walking in what God has called you to walk in. He wants to build his church and he wants to do it through you. He wants to use us because God is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's calling us to be a city on the hill. He's calling us to be a lighthouse in the darkness. And what he wants to do is he wants to use his people. He wants to use us. Don't allow past hurts and pains and things that you've experienced to hold you back from doing and walking in the word of God and what he's called you to walk in. Amen. Amen. May you extend, I just feel like maybe in this place, you right now, you just need to extend forgiveness where in those areas. I had to extend, actually, when I was going through this message this week, the Lord had to deal with me on one situation in my life that I felt like, man, I haven't extended forgiveness towards. I needed to just kind of extend forgiveness towards this party. I'm not, I don't want to share the story, but I'm, I had to Search my heart and just the Lord kind of revealed this thing to me. And Adam, you need to forgive this party. You need to forgive them. Maybe you in this room right now, you just need to take a moment to say, Lord, I forgive them. Lord, search my heart. I'm coming to bring an offering. And so this is what I want to do. I want to give you three things this morning. Three things on breaking the poverty mind mentality. Three things on breaking the poverty mentality mentality, because God is wanting to enlarge our borders and our influence, a mindset and a viewpoint that it's too big, that God can't do it, it will cause us not to walk in the vision, and so we got to break that mentality. So the first thing in doing that is this, it's giving cheerfully, giving cheerfully. Paul was talking to the church of Corinth, and he tells them this, he says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I love this. I love how the Amplified uh, reads as well. It says this, let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart. Many of you in this room, you've been praying, Lord, what would you have me give as we are building as a church? What would you have me give as an offering of over and above my tithe to build your church, God? And you have prayed and you have thoughtfully considered it and you see the purpose and the plan which God has. And then it says this, not gr- uh, grudgingly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And this, I love how the Amplified says this, and delights in the one whose heart is in his gift and delights in the one whose heart 
whose heart is in his gift. Now the word cheerful in the Greek, this is amazing. The word cheerful in the Greek is our English word hilarious. Can somebody laugh right now? (laughs) The word cheerful here in the Greek is this word hilarious. What does it mean? It means willing, good-natured, joyfully ready. I love that last part, joyfully ready. The word describes a spirit of enjoyment and giving that sweeps away all restraints and things that hinder us from giving. It's from this joyful place that God's heart of generosity is given to us. Listen, we were made in the image of God, and when we give just as God gave, then we become more like him. John 3, 16, a popular passage that many of you in this room know, for God so loved the world that he what? That he gave. When we give of ourselves, when we give ourselves in worship, when we give of ourselves financially speaking, when we give of ourselves to someone else, our time, our treasure, and our talents, what does it do? It makes us more like Jesus. When we give to the Lord, it makes us more into his image. I don't know about you, but I, I, my pursuit and my one desire is that I would be more like him. I want to be like Jesus. I'm not afraid to say that. That as we give to the Lord and as we do it, not reluctantly, but cheerfully with joy, we become more like Christ. We reflect his image. We are image barriers of the Lord. May we give cheerfully and be joyfully ready to give. And that word hilarious, hilarious, over the top giving, what will it do? It will kill every ounce of worship of money that's in your life. As you give, it kills that mammon spirit that is running so rampant in the world today. It does something. It gives you the kingdom mentality. So the next thing to break the poverty mindset, number two, is giving from a life of good stewardship. To break the poverty mentality, it's giving from a life of good stewardship. In Matthew 25, we find the story of what's also known as the parable of the talents. When Jesus taught, he often taught in in stories, in these parables, and um, Jesus is the master in this story. And what he does is he gives... Uh, talents to three different people. To one person, he gives one talent. To another person, he gives two talents. And to a third person, he gives five talents. He tells them, okay, I'm going to go away. You steward what I've given you. I'm going to come back, and you're going to be held accountable for what I've given you. Now, the person with five talents, what does it say in Scripture? Remember, this is Jesus telling this story. The person with five talents, he doubles his talents what has been given to him and and asked to be stewarded by Jesus, the master. And Jesus tells this person who's given five talents, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a little. Now inherit the kingdom of God. The person with two talents, he also doubled them and he said, yeah, you've been faithful with a little. Now you've inherited the kingdom of God. The person with one talent, well, what did he do? He took his talent and he hid it in the hill. And he made excuses about why he didn't heal. He didn't get any interest. And the master comes back and he, and he says to him, what have you done? You're just giving me just basically what I gave you. And he makes excuses for all this. Now, here's the most interesting thing about this parable and this story is that scholars will say that a talent is a year's wages. So one talent is one year's wages. So if you want to put this in perspective of today's economy, uh, last year, an average wage for the year was $74,000, $74,000. So that's one talent. So that's, I think it's going to be on the screen. So one talent, $74,000. The other person who had two talents, $149,000. And the three talents, $372,000. So what is amazing when I'm looking at this parable, and I had never really seen this before, is that, look at this in, in verse 21. Uh, we'll, we'll back up to verse 20, 21. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. 
let that sink in. A little. I'm thinking to myself, $372,000, that's not a little. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, God. How can this be a little? You see, look, you thought the $74,000 guy was the one that was faithful over a little because he hid it and he saved it and he did nothing with it. But no, he was what? He was the wicked and lazy one. He said, the one I have gave five talents to, he said, you have been faithful over what? A little. In my earthly mind, 372 k that's a lot of money. But for me, I don't want to think with an earthly mind. I want to think kingdom-minded. Anyone else in this room with me? I want to think kingdom-minded the way God sees it. Because I believe that God wants us to change our thinking, not with the false gospel of prosperity, but that we are able to see things differently from a kingdom perspective that will bring us building his kingdom together. Because one day he will stand before the Lord and he will ask you, what have you done? Have you, how have you stewarded what I've given you? Are you going to be the one who is given two talents and five talents or are you going to be the one who is given one? Because if you stood before the Lord right now, what would he say to you? Would he say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or would he say, you've been wicked and you've been lazy with what I've given you? I want to remind you that these are the words of Jesus. Are you stewarding well or are you stewarding like a wicked and lazy person? But here's the point of this entire parable, the entire story is this. That God has not asked us to hold on to what he's given us. But what he wants us to do is to live generously with an open hand, to meet the needs of the widow, the poor, those who are in need. He is asking us to live lives of generosity. And as we live lives of generosity, we have a saying around here that we want to give it away to keep it, right? That we be a people that give it away to keep it. And as we live lives of generosity, we become more like Christ, we become more like Jesus. And I just want to honor you right now as a congregation because by and large, man, we live generously. You are a generous congregation. You are a generous people. You love people and you want to give. You want to meet people's needs. So I applaud you. But, there, but is there some areas of more that the Lord wants to challenge us in in this area? I believe there is. May we have a kingdom mindset. So this, the third way, the last way that I want to give you is this. To break the poverty mindset because before we go to this one, I don't believe that, you know, we have money problems. I believe that we have sometimes heart problems when it comes towards finances. If we don't have money problems, we have heart problems. So the last way to break the poverty mindset is giving with a pure heart. That we would give with a pure heart. In 1 Samuel uh, 16, it's the story of King David. Um, before he's king, uh, he is anointed king by, um, forgetting his name right now. What is his name? Samuel. Thank you very much, notes, by Samuel. And uh, Samuel's told to go anoint a new king because uh, Saul's heart is not pure. And so he's told to go to Jesse's house, and Jesse lines up all of his sons except for David. David's off in the fields. And he lines up all of his sons and Samuel comes and he asks the Lord, okay, which one do you want me to anoint as king next? And he looks at the oldest, Eliab, and thinks, okay, that's got to be him. Eliab's got to be the one. He's tall, he's handsome, he looks the part. And God says, no, his heart is not pure. He goes down the line of all Jesse's sons and says, no, the one's not here. Well, do you have any more sons? And Jesse's like, yeah, I have one more. He's in the fields, he's the youngest. That can't be him, he's thinking. Well, David comes in and the the spirit of God speaks to Samuel and says, yeah, that's who I want you to anoint as king. But why did he want him to anoint as king? Because David had what? A pure heart. Look at this. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. Talking about Eliab. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know what's crazy is in the very next chapter, Eliab attacks David over his own heart. Look at this, 1 Samuel 17, 28. Now Eliab 
His eldest brother heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. This is Eliab saying to David, for you have come down to see the battle. Look, sometimes people will sometimes accuse others of what is really going on in their own heart. And here's what God said. I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. He's teaching Samuel a life lesson. He's teaching David a life lesson in this moment. He's teaching us a life lesson. David would be a man that would restore the army, that would restore Israel, that would restore worship in Israel, that would bring the tabernacle back to Israel. God said, I can't use any man that doesn't have a pure heart. Here's what he's saying. Basically, he's saying, I can't trust him. He's saying, I can't trust Eliab. He doesn't have a pure heart. Imagine being the firstborn. Imagine being the eldest. It's your right. It's your right to be in that place. But God said, I can't trust you. I can't trust you to fight Goliath. I can't trust you to be king. What if God wanted to bless some of you in this room, but you weren't yet trustworthy? What if God wanted to bless us, but we weren't yet trustworthy? I believe in a lot of ways the Lord's been working on my own individual heart. I think maybe he's been working on your own individual heart to make us to where we can come to a place where God can trust us. Listen, these are heart issues. When it comes to finances, it's a heart issue. And look, this whole moment in 1 Samuel 16, the anointing of David as king, is an offering. It's a sacrifice moment. David's beginning his ministry with an offering, and he ends his ministry with an extravagant offering. Look at this, 1 Chronicles 22.5. For David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced. And the house that is to be built for the house of the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent. Exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all the lands. I will therefore make preparations for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. David, the one who is pure in heart, started his ministry with an offering and ended his ministry with an offering. This is an extravagant offering. David said the temple must be incredible. It must be exceedingly magnificent. And David supplied all of the resources before his death for Solomon to build the temple before he died. So here's what's incredible. Do you know how much Solomon's temple would cost in today's economy? This is a number that blows me away. In today's economy, Solomon's temple would cost $42 trillion. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's what I said when I looked at this. Solomon's temple would cost $42 trillion. David, he said he's got to be exceedingly magnificent. I think he succeeded in that. $42 trillion. And I said to, and I was thinking, as we were starting this, this process with the rise and build, Lord, help me to have a kingdom mentality, a kingdom mindset of what, how you see finances, Lord. How you see, God, the, the resources. Because there's a lot of money in this world. Lord, help me have this mindset. So breaking it down, $42 trillion. So the Jaguar Stadium was built back in 1995 for $192 million. Now there's a new thing on the docket for uh, a new stadium, if you guys know, for it to be built for $2 billion. That would build a stadium in surrounding areas. So when you uh, divide $42 trillion by $2 billion, you get 21000 So my mind can't even compute this, honestly. So for the cost of building Solomon's temple, you could build 21,000 Jaguars stadiums. What in the world? Like we can't even compute the amount of money that is. But when you begin to think about kingdom-mindedness and the way God views money, it's like, what in the world, God? Lord, you're so big and so great. You, you own and have everything. It's kind of like when you, when you give a kid $100 and they think like it's a million bucks. $100 isn't hardly uh, uh, 
pay for a, a date night anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, what is going on? But $42 trillion. And David, he gave this as an offering, an act of worship. He started his ministry, so to speak, with an offering, and he ended his ministry with an extravagant offering before the Lord. Listen, I'm saying that this wasn't either just a lifetime of giving for David. This was a one-time offering. David gave trillions for the Lord. It's insane. But how many times have you heard someone say, I want to dance like David danced. I want to worship like David worshiped. I want to slay giants like David slayed giants. How many people have you heard say, I want to give like David gave? Maybe his dancing reflected his giving. Maybe his worship, I submit to you this morning, maybe his worship reflected his giving. When we give, we are not to give reluctantly, but we are to give joyfully. We are to give with an open hand to our Lord and to trust him in everything. And as we come today to bring this offering to the Lord, may we understand that as we steward what God has asked us to steward and give and be obedient in what God has asked us to give, that he uses it and he blesses, he does, he blesses his people. May we worship him through our giving. Listen, I said at the very beginning that our goal was two things, to, that we would give cheerfully and other goals to recognize and know just how big God is and to have a kingdom mindset towards finances. And if God's vision is before us, I believe he is going to provide for our every need. And I believe as we bring this offering today, it's really an offering of worship. It's an offering of worship unto God. That the Lord is going to multiply it just like he multiplied the fish and the loaves. Do you believe that, church? So, Lord, we worship you this morning. We don't give reluctantly or out of compulsion. We give as worship unto you. God, you